Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator political scientist Tony Stewart in welcoming today's guest. On behalf of our staff and panelist Janelle Burke, I want to take this opportunity to wish you a very happy holiday season. Over the show last week and the next two, we're in during the holiday season and we hope you're enjoying uh, your time at home and, and a restful time. And we decided that the most uh, nice present we could give you would be to talk about books. So, so many of you are readers and we have three guests on the program today that are so qualified to talk about uh, books and on this program we're going to deal with uh, fiction and next week it'll be nonfiction. Last year we did this and we got a great reaction, people wanting to read some of those books. First of all, I welcome to the program Ann Porter. She is a member of the faculty at North Idaho College in the field of art and for the very first time it's very much a pleasure to have you on our program. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson who's been on the program many times and is a very gifted person. In fact, she was chosen a few years ago as the Teacher of the Year in the United States at Community Colleges and she is the Chair of the North Idaho College Communication and Fine Arts Division. My friend uh, of a long time, welcome back to the program. Thanks a lot, Tony. It's really fun to be here. And our third guest, who too is a colleague and has been on the program a number of other times, is Denise Clark. Uh, she is a North Idaho College librarian and I must say about her that for the past 16 years, every time I call her about ordering the book, she already knew about it. So <laughs> I never win that contest. I tell my students, Denise knows everything. And with that, we'll start the program and I welcome our panelist, Janelle Burke, and she'll commence today's questioning. My first question is going to have to do with your favorite book of this, of this year. And so let's start with uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, Jenny, can you tell us oh what um, <laughs> it was your favorite book? Now, you see, we're starting here with the thing. Some people save the best till last, but we're, we're going to start right with, the, with your favorites of the season. Okay. And, um, well, that's really hard because I think I'm in the middle of one now. I haven't decided. But it's a <laughs> rerun of a book I read years ago, and that's Anti Mame by Patrick Dennis, which I read, I don't know, ages ago before it, I think, came out even as a movie uh, with Rosalind Russell. And one of the reasons I like it so well is that it has a famous quotation that I've been using in my humanities class. That is, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. And I just love her joy de vie and her whole attitude uh, about living. So I say, I say anti mame right now. Okay. And how about you? What, what's a favorite this year for you? Gosh, I'd have to say it's not a new book, but it's one I just reread, and that is Mrs. Dalloway. Um, I read that first as a young woman and just reread it, and it's just an incredible novel. Good. It, but you said you it's hard to pick, so you must have some others that are favorites, too. Oh, everything I read is a favorite while I'm reading it. <laughs> No. How about you, Denise? Uh, um, a favorite uh, this year? Maybe I would say a, a favorite author uh, so far. She has written three books, and uh, her name is Sarah Water, and um, she is she wrote one called Affinity, and then another. This one was up for the Booker Award. This was mm -hmm. a finalist for the Booker Award this year, and it's called Fingersmith. Sarah Waters. Um, she also wrote, her first novel was called Tipping the Velvet, and they're all set in Victorian England, which of course is my favorite, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite period, my favorite time period. And um, so I would say that Sarah Waters was a great find this year, Good. all of her novels, and maybe I'll spend a little time talking about my favorite. Okay. Well, you just built my bridge, and so <laughs> I'll start with Denise. I always enjoy this show so much. Uh, would you take uh, and read a passage, or, or maybe give a little background of the uh, thesis and the theme, and then uh, from that or another book, read uh, something that, uh, that you find very powerful. Uh, Virginia just gave us a wonderful, what a powerful quote that was. I think the power of words is very important. So, Denise, let's start with you. Well, I, I'll, t I'll just talk a little bit about affinity. It's, it's set in... Uh, uh, the Victorian London of the 1870s, and, and our main character is a, 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 a Victorian spinster. She's 30, so of course she was considered a spinster at that time. Her name is Margaret Pryor, and she's recovering from 
a rather disappointing love affair. And her love interest was another woman who has just married her brother. And to keep, she's in, she's very depressed and she's under medical um, surveillance and medical care. And she's decided that she's going to volunteer time at a women's prison called Millbank, Millbank Women's Prison, which was at that time one of the most horrific prisons. You know, well, Victorian London was noted for its rather horrific prisons. Uh, it's a women's prison, and there she meets a spiritualist by the name of Selena Dawes. And Selena is probably one of the most conniving, but one of the brightest women I have encountered <laughs> in a contemporary novel. And I, I don't want to kind of uh, give away all of the machinations sure. of Selena, uh, who uses Margaret as a vehicle of escape from Millbank. Um, and of course leaves Margaret uh, devastated uh, it, at the end of the book. But it is, uh, um, it, it's just a wonderfully written book. Um, Can the, you give us a, maybe a passage or something? Um, I haven't picked a passage from this one. We'll, we'll do another one then. And, um, but I can give you a passage from, now here's another one. I brought, <laughs> I brought really, I don't want to call them genre novels because I don't, they're not. But they're all set in Victorian England. <laughs> and they're all contemporary novels, but their setting is Victorian England. This is a new one that's just out to rave reviews. I usually don't read New York Times bestseller list books, but I was sucked in by this one. The Crimson Petal and the White by Michael Faber. And um, there is a passage. I knew I was going to love this one when um, I came across this passage right here. And I'll share this with you. Uh, the shopkeepers are just beginning to open their shops and they're being observed by a young prostitute from her, um, you know, her, her slum dwelling window. The shopkeepers of Greek Street care nothing about the shadowy creatures who actually manufacture the goods they sell. The world has outgrown its quaint rural intimacies and now it's the modern age. An order is put in for 50 cakes of coal tar soap, and a few days later a card arrives and the order is delivered. How that soap came to exist is no question for a modern man. Everything in this world issues fully formed from the loins of, be of a benign monster called manufacture. <laughs> a never-ending stream of objects of graded quality, of perfect uniformity, from an orifice hidden from behind veils of smoke. You may point out that the clouds of smut from the factory chimneys of Hammersmith and Lambeth blacken all the city alike, a humbling reminder of where the cornucopia really comes from. But humility is not a trait for the modern man, and filthy air is quite good enough for breathing. Its only disadvantage is the film of muck that accumulates on shop windows. But what use is there, the shopkeepers sigh in nostalgia for t past times. The machine age has come, the world will never be clean again, but oh, what a compensation. <laughs> Use of the English language. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I was sucked in. <laughs> yes, I can see. Virginia, we're going to come to you with the same question. Okay. Uh, two parts. First of all, is uh, you had already identified one of your very favorite books. Would you give us a little bit of the theme? Well, Anti Mame is written by Patrick Dennis. I, I don't have it with me because it's still partially read. but. Um, Patrick Dennis was a really interesting character, I found out, because in the latest edition, there's an afterword, well, I often read the afterwords before I read the books, uh, written by his son and explained that Patrick Dennis really did have a woman who was a kind of anti-mame, but a whole lot of her was invented. And he shows up as an orphan at her doorstep and she has the, she's having a wild party, but anti-mame always has wild parties. And she's dressed like a, in a picture that he has, like a gypsy, and he gets there and there's this very Chinese looking woman. But Auntie Mame has a lot of money, and poor little Patrick is uh, an orphan. His mother died at his birth, and his uh, father had a heart attack and was an alcoholic. But uh, anyway, this very nervous nursemaid brings him there, and his father's only proviso on letting his sister, Auntie Mame, take him over is that he has to be raised in the church uh, as an Episcopalian. Well, Auntie Mame is into every kind of religion, every kind of life, and she loves to travel, and she takes Patrick wherever she goes and uh, makes him understand, not through schooling, but through all of her friends and her adventures, what it really means to love your fellow man and be kind to them and so forth. 
and it's not didactic at all, but it's just uh, it's so refreshing to meet her and to see what a character and go on this she was. Travel. Oh yes, and yeah. you know I love to travel, so yeah. she's one of my favorites. But you know, I also brought another old timer. I brought some newer authors, but this is the uh, anniversary of John, Stein John Steinbeck and uh, of his birth. He was born in 1902, and so I did do a book talk this summer for the Idaho Humanities Council. They asked me, I'm a brand new member so I didn't know how to say no yet, uh, to do a book talk and they wanted to do John Steinbeck and I said, well, really Grapes of Wrath is awfully long and this was at our Camp Humanities, a retreat we have. So I chose Cannery Row, which I'd read in high school and I'm sort of like Denise in the way I know she loves Victorian novels and in high school I had a Steinbeck period and I actually <laughs> was going to major in marine biology. I set out in college to be a marine biologist. and. One of the things I discovered in rereading Steinbeck, because I reread several of his books, is what an incredibly good writer he is. And I think that he's not as famous maybe as Hemingway. Mm -hmm. By the way, I read Hemingway uh, at a book talk last spring, and I almost couldn't get through it. I just, he's really quite a male chauvinist. But anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, Mary Wollstonecraft. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Virginia plays that role in such a wonderful way. But I, I, I think it's interesting that you and I would both choose passages that are kind of setting passages. So is it okay if I read this passage Please. from Cannery Row? It's the very beginning of Cannery Row. Um, and in fact, the passages in Cannery Row are sometimes uh, one of setting and almost a philosophical bent, and then the action and the plot with these really charming characters. But there's just a paragraph that begins it. Cannery Row in Monterey in California is a poem, a stink, a grating noise, a quality of light, a tone, a habit, a nostalgia, a dream. Cannery Row is the gathered and scattered, tin and iron and rust and splintered wood, chipped pavement and weedy lots and junk heaps, sardine canneries of corrugated iron, honky-tonks, restaurants and whorehouses, and little crowded groceries and laboratories and flop houses. Its inhabitants are, as the man once said, whores, pimps, gamblers, and sons of bitches, by which he meant everybody. Had the man looked through another peephole, he might have said saints and angels and martyrs and holy men, and he would have meant the same thing. So he has this way of seeing the good and the bad in everyone, and then that really sets the tone for the rest of the novel, which is that some of these people really are pimps and awful people, but on the other hand, they're pretty angelic and can be. So um, I still like Steinbeck, and that's all the way from high school. Just the, the gift some people have with the, the power of words. Before we go to Anne and ask the same question, I want to make sure we get into the show, too, some of the new um, readings you've done. Okay. So would you just quickly just sure. list the title and um, uh, your recommendation yes, of them? Yes, I'm doing a book talk in February on this book. This is Bee Season by Myla Goldberg. I don't know which camera wants to look at that one. That's fine right there. Okay. And then um, this is one, A White Teeth by Zadie Smith. She has a new book out. And this I saw in people's hands when I was in Europe a couple of years ago, and I saw it in Norwegian and Swedish and French, and I finally broke down and read that one, and she wrote it when she was 25, and it's uh, really an interesting study of London. I really kind of like reading uh, Asian writers, both uh, translated in the original. This is a national book winner, uh, Waiting by Ha Jin, which is about a man who is separated from his wife, and <laughs> she keeps saying that she will divorce him but doesn't and he's in love with another woman and it's all about people's waiting and this is in uh, post-modern China or not post-modern I should say post-revolutionary China and then this is one of my favorite authors I don't find her in any book talks but talk about getting hooked this is Diana Gabaldon this is her latest novel called The Fiery Cross and you on the back you'll see that she has her picture taken at Stonehenge because this is a series of books that's about time travel, and I'm not a big science fiction fan, but once I got past that you can travel in time, especially to the Scottish border ballads, and Jamie, the really good-looking and manly man that he is, uh, I think the series begins with a book called Dragonfly and Amber, and then it follows the characters through time up to the Revolutionary War in the United States. And so I really recommend Diana Gabaldon. And all of her books are this fat, and they're page turners. And boy, they're juicy. Uh, she really did her homework on these, so it's not just romance novels per se, but so it's really traveling, it's really through, traveling time. through time, but also it's. Uh, based in the history of the period and the time traveling heroine is a nurse and so she learns about me uh, the medicine of the times and mm -hmm. so it's political, historical That's and romantic. Cool. And Anne, the same thing to you. First of all, uh, you might give us the theme or thesis of 
the book that you identified as your favorite, or, or one of your favorites? Well, I, it's definitely one of my favorites. Um, really, Mrs. Dalloway takes place in the course of one day, and it's the story of a woman giving a party. It's that simple. Um, and at the same time, it's that complex because it's pulling together little pieces of memory of other people's lives, and it's all converging on this one moment in time. And I think that's why I really like Virginia Woolf so, so well, is that she's able to take disparate moments and have them both make sense and not make sense at the same time and in a way that you can almost live with. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but almost. And, I, and you have several books with you, too. <clears throat> Is oh. there one that you'd like to have a passage from? I think that All our viewers them. enjoy <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, the, the magic of the writing. Um, I brought three books. I brought Mrs. Dalloway. I brought a Michael Ondaatje book, In the Skin of a Lion. And I brought another one of my all-time favorites. I brought, I brought Possession. Fabulous book. And <laughs> Denise, I, I think it's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> two, out, two out of three. Gonna I me think today. possession just works on so many different levels. The first time I read it, I just ripped through it. My life came to a halt, <laughs> <laughs> and I, it became the wickedest sort of page turner. I just could not stop. Would you want one of the, you give us a, a short passage from one of them? Um, yes, let's pick, I think Mrs. Dalloway really okay. lends itself to a quotation here. And this is um, during the afternoon before the party, and uh, um, one of the par party goers is sitting on a park bench, and he's sitting next to a woman who's knitting. The gray nurse resumed her knitting as Peter Walsh, on the hot seat beside her, began snoring. In her gray dress, moving her hands indefatigably, yet quietly, she seemed like the champion of the rights of sleepers, like one of those spectral presences which rise in twilight in woods made of sky and branches. I just wonder how one can develop such use of the language. <laughs> it's, it's no wonder one likes to read. Uh, Janelle Burke. All of you have talked about books, and, and most of them are longer books, but I know that there are some writings that are shorter, and so I would like to ask each one of you about a short work, and let's start again with Jenny, um, something that might be shorter for someone out there that you would recommend. <coughs> Well, I'm going back to Steinbeck, and Canary Row is really quite short. Um, it's um, not quite 200 pages. And then, of course, uh, Steinbeck also has A Red Pony and The Pearl, and they're very short, but they're, again, beautiful pieces of writing by him. Um, I'm trying to think of collections of short stories because I do often get into them, but it's I'm not coming up with one really quickly. But I'd say they're really good for reading because they have that. In fact, I do have an anthology here that I just picked up. It's called Braided Lives, and it's an anthology of multicultural American writing. So it contains uh, writings by Asian writers, African American writers, and so forth. And there are several short stories and some poems in here as well. So um, one of them that I read is called Making Do by Linda Hogan. So this is one of the books I'm reading now, too, that has shorter selections so that I can pick those up and maybe go to sleep to one of them and uh, <laughs> not and, and get too carried away. Just a short clue for people, where do you pick up your books? Do you usually do that at the library or do you do that just everywhere? Everywhere. Everywhere I go. Uh, this book I got at a humanities conference I just went to. Um, I get them at used bookstores, uh, Value Village, uh, Aunties, the library. I'm always going online and seeing what's in the Hayden Library, Post Falls Library. So what a great device, because if, if it isn't there, if it isn't Post Falls, they'll say it's at Hayden, and I'll zoom in my car out there before someone else gets it, <laughs> or I'll know how many holds are on it and how long I might have to wait. Um, I, I'm just always scrounging for books, and my husband jokes at me when I'm in Costco and says, don't we already have a book because I have to go buy the books? As I said, that's where I found Auntie Maine, so I'm always on the lookout for books. 
And Anne, what about you? Is there a short story that you've read this year or something that you would recommend for our viewers? I just read a really, in, in the latest Atlantic Monthly, I just read a really nice short story, and I was about to say, do you read the Atlantic? Mm, occasionally, I don't. Okay, I was hoping you would bail me out oh. <laughs> because I couldn't remember the title of the story, but it's um, so it's you're just saying that perhaps a place to find good short stories are in some magazines oh. as well. I, I find The Atlantic is a good start. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, it's uneven, but I think they're always, um, it's always worth the effort. It is. Um, so yeah, I, anywhere. I'm really open to anything. Denise, what about you? What about what, a favorite short story? A, a favorite short story, I have to go back to one I keep rereading. It's in a collection called Writers of the Purple Sage, and the author is David Quammen, who really isn't noted for his fiction. He writes a, a lot of nonfiction, and um, I was, in fact, I was really surprised to see this short story of, of his in a collection because I was familiar with his nonfiction work, and and um, I picked it up and read it, and I think I read it about twelve years ago. Mm -hmm and I keep returning to it. It's a coming-of-age story of a young boy on a, on a hunting trip with his father in the wilds of Montana, and there is, of course, you know, uh, his parents are divorced, he is, he is unhappy with both of them, he, he feels inadequate, uh, he can't meet his father's expectations as a young man, um, but this hunting trip changes all of that. And he becomes, on this hunting trip, a man, and a remarkable young man. And it's, and it's, Kwaman always refers to the characters as the boy and the father. The man and the boy, or the father and the boy. They have no names, so they become universalized. And so you, you can see this playing out. So it is a rite of passage story. And it is one of the most powerful stories I think I've ever read. I love giving, giving it especially to young men to read who say, I don't like to read. Then you must read. <laughs> What's the title of this? It's called Walking Out. Walking Out. Walking Out. Mm -hmm. And you also have some responsibilities for ordering. Oh, and yes. so do you order uh, fiction along with, uh, in your library oh, collection, all of your... Um, other nonfiction titles? Absolutely, and, and what we like to, we like to, to buy primarily literary fiction, that's true, and we like to buy fiction works by local and regional authors, um, and we like to buy uh, award winners. I will buy the Booker Prize every year and some of the runners-up and, and the Pulitzer Prize novels and the National Book Award novels and uh, the uh, Whitbread Award winners and you know, other literary awards. You know, if I find them, we'll buy, we'll buy them. And Updike just published a new novel. I can't wait to read that one. So, that's <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we do. But very small percentage of our collection is fiction. We've had a lot of authors on this program too, and we ask them when they write, and uh, it's very different, and their styles are different, and and. Uh, how much they do a day and all. And I have a similar question for you readers, and, uh, and I'll start with you. You're all very busy. You are faculty members or librarians, and you have a lot of responsibilities here and your families and so forth. Uh, help our viewers, who, particularly younger viewers, who are wanting to have a career reading. How does one uh, bring that into one's daily life or weekly uh, and manage? How kind of schedule do you use in relation to your writing? When do you, uh, excuse me, you're reading, when do you tend to read? And oh, I steal time. <laughs> um, whenever. I usually have two or three books laying around just like you do. And um, sometimes I'll just pick it up. Uh, sometimes I'll walk around the house reading. Or um, sometimes in the evening. Um, I do the, the, I am a member of the Drop the Book Club <laughs> <laughs> late at night when it falls on your nose. <laughs> do you need a, an atmosphere in which is rather quiet when you're reading, or can a lot of things be going on around you when you're reading? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, you do focus on what that's happening. Virginia, how do you do this? Uh, sounds very similar. Um, 
I also am in the drop the book in the bathtub club. <laughs> I've done that <laughs> while reading. Um, I usually have to do it on the weekends, or I just spend my summers in a nonstop file of books because during the year I don't often have time. But um, I read. Uh, I go in the bathtub. My husband and I have sort of a contest. We have only one bathroom, and we both like to soak. And so uh, he gets the Sunday mornings for the newspaper, and I take the Saturday mornings for the books. So um, that's when I read, or sometimes I read at night, but it is mostly on the weekends if I have time that I do that. But I think, if, like all of us, if you're an avid reader, you read the milk cartons, you read the <laughs> cereal boxes, you read everything that comes. So it's just... A it, habit that just a part of life. Oh, it is. It is. And if there's anything, I mean, I read everything, don't you guys? Just catalogs. catalogs. Even oh, my husband's yes. dirt and gravel stuff that comes. I'm if there's nothing else lying around, just out of curiosity, <laughs> what are you supposed to do? Dirt and gravel. <laughs> and Spudman also comes to our house. That has some interesting stories in it. Oh, <laughs> Miss Renaissance. Okay. Uh, Denise, how about your reading style? Oh. Well, I, I love to, if I can, I'm not an early morning person, but w those rare times <laughs> when I get up early in the morning, I love to read that. And I do go, th I do experience bouts of insomnia, which is wonderful because I get up and I read, <laughs> you know, three o'clock in the morning, I have a book, you know, under my nose. I tend to read in the evenings uh, uh, when I get home from work, if I don't have to take work home, you know, with me. I turn the television set off. I'm, I'm not a big watcher of television. I mean, if I have, a, you know, my preference is always the printed word. Um, so I tend to read, but I read at all times. I mean, if I'm cooking and it says stir this pot 20 minutes, well, I'll have a book under my <laughs> nose while I'm stirring the pot at the same time. So, and I always carry a book with me. I never go any place without a book. I mean, I never take a trip without a book. So you're traveling, never, you always have books with you? Always, like always. on planes and all, that's a good time Always, to because I don't trust any of the, the bookstores in airports. I, I shouldn't say that. I've actually found a couple of good titles. But oh, on that note, I have to bring yes. the program to conclusion. On behalf of Janelle Burke and our panel, uh, our, of our panel and our staff, we thank you very much for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure as it always is each year when we put these kind of programs together. And I'd like to say to our viewers, the good news is that our same three guests will be back again next week as we're going through this holiday season to talk about uh, nonfiction books. And for you, whatever preference you have having the two shows, we hopefully meet that uh, need of yours. Please be with us again next week. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.